awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right, y'all. So we've been talking about Moses. Can y'all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. We've been talking about Moses and uh, the exodus from Egypt. Before that, we spoke about Joseph. And I don't know which ones you were here for, Chasey. Um, but right now, we are going to be talking about Israel at Mount Sinai. And this is the time of the law. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea into the wilderness of Sinai. When they came to Marah, they found bitter water unsuitable for drinking. When the people murmured, did we already do the giving of the law, Laura? I think we did. I don't think so. We we keep, re yeah. keep reading? No, we haven't done it yet. Yeah, it's, it's there. Sorry, y'all. Uh -huh. It's, we didn't do it last week, so I'm lost. <laughs> All right. So when they came to Marah, they found bitter water, water unsuitable for drinking. When the people murmured against Moses, God showed him a tree. When Moses cut it down and cast it into the water, the water became sweet. Sometimes life may be bitter, but Jesus is the tree that can sweeten every life. How sweet is that? After three months on their journey from Egypt, they arrived at Mount Sinai. The people remained there for a period of one year. What took place at Sinai marked the beginning of Israel's national history, the covenant that God made with Abraham and confirmed to Isaac and Jacob became a national covenant. At Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the law, which included the Ten Commandments, as well as other moral, ceremonial, and civil laws. God intended for Israel to live by the law until Jesus came in the fullness of time. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Galatians 3 and 24. The law pointed out sin and the shortcomings of all human efforts to live holy without God's indwelling spirit. God also gave Moses the plan of the tabernacle, which was the physical dwelling place of God's spirit in the midst of the people of Israel. So what, what stood out to y'all in that little bit right there? That was like a lot right there. Sorry, I was getting some drink real quick. It was across the room. That's okay. What about you, Laura? She's muted. I don't know where she's going. But what stood out to me um, is that is the law. So the law, you can give someone a bunch of rules and, and as human beings, we'll never live up to that standard. We're not going to be perfect. We're not going to walk perfectly according to those rules. We can do our best, but we're always going to fall short. And that's what the law taught us is that we can try, try, try by our own power to live up to God's standards, but it's never going to work. And that is what the law taught us, that we aren't good enough, that we need God's power, God's Holy Spirit living in us so that we can follow these rules and follow these statutes and live righteously. And we're not going to be perfect until the day the Lord comes and, and takes us with him, or maybe we die and we go to heaven. But, um, but we are promised to continually get better as we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're baptized in Jesus name. And then after that, we will continually, as we're striving for it, get better walk more holy walk more righteously as we, the longer we live until we're perfected in christ <clears throat> so that that's something that really stood out to me i know when i was a little girl um and i you know promising god oh i'm never gonna lie again well that was a lie because <laughs> i i was a little girl so you know when I stole a candy bar and my mom asked me if I stole a candy bar and I said no. And then I would go to God like, 
I'm sorry, God. I don't know why I lied. <laughs> you know, but really, I shouldn't have stole the candy bar either. Um, <laughs> you know, so I was a sinner as a little kid and I couldn't measure up to the standards that God um, that God had for me. And I felt so much pressure to do so. I didn't realize that I was unable to do so. I didn't understand that I needed the Holy Spirit to 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 quit doing those things because now I don't really lie or cheat. I've I've told like some white lies here and then and I repent for them. But um but man I used to be a liar, a thief and all sorts of stuff. And then Jesus changed my heart. And if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't be the person that I am today doing my utmost to live righteously for him. All right. So I hope I explained that okay. The tabernacle, man's approach to God. When the Lord gave Moses the plan of the tabernacle on Mount Sinai, he admonished Moses to follow his specifications in its construction to the letter. Exodus 25 and 1 through 9. Let's read that one. You don't have your Bible on you, huh? Now that I notice, no. Hold on. Let me grab it. Mm-hmm. Exodus 25 and 1 through 9. Uh, let, me see. let me know when you get there. Oh, whoa, whoa. What was it again? One Exodus 20. 25. Oh, 25, 25. 1 through 9. Hmm. All right, I'm on there. Do you want to read or you want me to read? You go first. All right. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and sweet incense. Y'all, I got to change the battery on my, um, oh, I got to change the battery on it. Hold on a second. The battery on my camera just went out. It's okay. Take your time. Mm. See, y'all, we're talking too much, and that's what, (laughs) so my battery died already. For those who don't know, we were having a pretty cool conversation earlier before we started the stream. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks. Because they wouldn't have understood that. <laughs> we can start having a prayer before we do uh, the people. The, the... <laughs> the Bible study, you have to bring our focus and attention to God. Yeah, I just uh, didn't think about it. Um... Yeah, we started at first and then we don't do it no more. We need to start doing it more. I feel like we lost that connection. Yeah, you want to pray? let's let's do one at the end of the bible study what do you say all right that sounds like a lovely idea i don't know if um i don't know if uh let's see here hey laura are you still there Hello. I'm here. Right. my dad's pantry so you guys can't really hear me it's all good just making sure I'm just trying to fix my video, y'all. I don't remember how to do it. Um, maybe I need to turn it off and turn it back on. I don't think that helped. How did I do that before? Hmm. Well, if you can't figure it out, YouTube is a good helper. I don't know. I'm just going to reset. Bum, bum, bum. <clears throat> I'm not sure. There was a point where, oh, here it is. Stop, start video, stop video. No. They kept turning on and off. My video? Oh, yeah, I know. Here. Oop, that's my other webcam. Hello. Hey. That, that was my unmade bed and everything. I don't know why it's, um, I don't know why it's not working, y'all. Oh, I know why. It's not plugged in. (laughs) 
Yeah, that's embarrassing. I showed everyone my unmade bed. I do make my bed, y'all. Most times. <laughs> Most days. I even have a book. No one has it on my bedside called um, Make Your Bed. Yeah, I was going to say, someone has to been reading their Make Their Bed book. <laughs> I had to get up early and um, um, shoot some YouTube videos this morning, so that's what I just didn't make my bed. But. I have a futon on top of my mattress, so every time I wake up, I just adjust that real quick, adjust my pillows, and fix my blanket. <laughs> All right, y'all. So I think um, we did Exodus 25, 1 through 9, and... We're on number, f you just got done with five and then your thing went out on six, I believe. Okay, so oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for sweet incense. Onyx yeah. stones, what? Yeah, it's on, just like, I'm on the, oh, she on forgot. The <laughs> Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instru instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. And so God is very particular in the way that he wants to be worshipped, the way he wants to be obeyed. God is very particular. It's not anything goes, just kind of make the house, my house, however you want it. You know, God gave them very detailed instructions about how he wanted to be worshipped and, and the building of which he was going to be worshipped in. And so God also gives us very specific precise instructions and he expects us to perform them by the power of his holy spirit the tabernacle man's approach to god the court of the tabernacle the court of the tabernacle was approximately 150 feet long and 75 feet wide it had one gate on the east side four doorposts supported hangings of four collars of cloth purple, scarlet, blue, and white. There was only one entrance into the courtyard. Likewise, there is only one way of salvation through Jesus Christ. John 10 and 9. You want to read this one? Uh, let me get to it. I'm sure. Let's see. Let's see here. I haven't got to John yet, so. After Luke. No, I mean, like, I haven't read up to it yet, so I don't know where it is. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I'm on Joshua. Oh, okay. Judges, Samuel. That's going backwards, I think. Oh, wait. Kings. It's going to be in the New Testament. Hmm? It's going to be in the New Testament. I don't have it. You don't have the New Testament? Wait, no, hold on. <laughs> I got the New King James Version. That's what I got. No, I meant there's an Old Testament and there's a New Testament. Um, I have no clue. In the Bible. So the Old Testament is what about the book? Old Covenant. John? Yeah. John. Uh, yeah, it's in here. Did you ask me something? What? Did we ask you something? Yeah. Jeremiah Ezekiel. No. <laughs> okay, all right. Because I like stepped out for a while. It was quiet. I don't know if y'all were waiting on me. Yeah, we heard you. Look, where are you at, John? There it is. Hold on. What was it again? John what? John 10 and 9. John 10 and 9. John 10 and 9. Mm hmm. I know someone is watching going, flip it faster. <laughs> yeah, they're like, I got to it 10 minutes ago, Tracy. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right. Uh, the page that says 9 and 10? 10. 10 and 9. 10 and 9. All right, got it. Ready? Yes. All right. Because he opened your eyes. No, nope, that's said, not it. Oh, no. John 10, chapter 10. Oh, right there, right there. I found it. 
Ten and nine. All right, that's it. The thief does not. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, yeah, nine. <laughs> it's okay. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Mm. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life. <laughs> life. And that they may have it more abundantly. Mm -hmm. That's good. So Jesus is the door. And if any man enter, he shall be saved. So Jesus is the door. All right. So inside the courtyard was the brazen altar, the brazen lever, <clears throat> laver, and the tabernacle itself, the tabernacle was approximately 15 feet high, 15 feet wide, and 45 feet long. It consisted of the holy place and the holy of holies. These two rooms were separated by a veil of blue, purple, and scarlet. In the holy place was the golden candlestick, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense, and the holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant. There abode the Spirit of God between two golden cherubims located on the lid of the Ark, which was called the Mercy Seat. Of course, God is omnipresent, right? Um, so he's present everywhere, but he manifested his glory there to show his covenant relationship with Israel. God has always desired to dwell with his people, but sin has always separated humanity from God. From the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the death of Christ, God has dwelt in the hearts of his people in a new and wonderful way. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you? 1 Corinthians 3 and 16. So, what stands out to me here is that, okay, so during the old covenant, God's glory manifested just in that back room, that holy of holies. That's where he stayed. No one could really enter. Sometimes a priest would have to enter to light the candles and the incense. But even if he didn't do that right, he'd be dead on the spot. So it was very, God was very particular. Not just anyone could enter and, and experience his glory. After Jesus Christ came and he died, he was resurrected and ascended. That is when the Holy Spirit was given to us. So now we can experience his glory, his power, his presence. Have you ever been at church, you guys, and you just feel his presence and it's just so powerful. Like, you don't, you never really felt anything like that aside from maybe in church or now, if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, sometimes you can pray and you feel that glory, that power, that presence of God. Before that wasn't, you couldn't just experience that. Before Jesus uh, was resurrected, you couldn't just experience God's presence like that. It was, he, he didn't show himself like that. He just stayed in his holy of holies where no man could really enter until he poured out his spirit on us. But do y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know what you're talking that, about. That presence, that that glory, and sometimes it's so heavy, it's so overwhelming, and all you can just do is cry and lift up your hands and stuff, and it's just a beautiful, a beautiful presence. Um, but we weren't always able to, as mankind, we weren't always able to experience it the way we do now. The altar of sacrifice. <clears throat> The priest approached the tabernacle first by way of the brazen altar, and there he offered the sacrifice of sin. The brazen altar was approximately seven and a half feet square and four and a half feet high. It was made of acacia wood overlaid with brass. It was a place of death and the shedding of blood. It represents the death of Jesus, which purchased our salvation. It also points to repentance, which is our identification with the death of Jesus and our personal death to sin and self-will. Everyone must approach God through repentance. Jesus said, except ye repent, 
ye shall all likewise perish. So did y'all know that, that repentance was our death? Repentance is our death to sin. Um, did y'all know that? No, I did not know that. And when Jesus died, yeah. he died to sin. Yeah. And, um, and that's what the sacrifices of the animals and everything it represents. That's why those animals were um, like a makeshift atonement. Like if they wanted to atone their sins, they'd have to sacrifice an animal. And it was all pointing to the future sacrifice of Jesus who died to sin and death. So Jesus killed sin and death. And, and then we died of sin and death through repentance, turning from our sin um, and receiving that for forgiveness from God. So the altar was a prominent feature of the tabernacle and its worship. It was placed immediately in front of the gate of the court of the tabernacle. So say you walk in the gate, you're praising God, giving thanks, and now you need to go to the altar of repentance. It was placed immediately in front of the gate of the court of the tabernacle. It was the first object that met the eye of the worshiper as he came into the court to present his sacrifice unto the Lord. The altar was not hidden in some remote place in the court removed from the gaze of the people, nor did it stand inside the tabernacle where only a few could approach it. It was placed where all could see it and where all could approach it. Only the priests could see the golden lampstand, the table of showbread and the altar of incense, which were inside the tabernacle itself. No one but the high priest was permitted to enter the Holy of Holies, and he did so only on the day of atonement. By contrast, the altar was plainly visible from without. In fact, no one could enter into the holy place except by passing the sacred altar. Oh, wait, the sacred emblem where the sacrificial blood of the animals was offered. The altar teaches that not one will enter heaven except by the blood of Jesus, who stands as an altar of sacrifice for all who would approach God says john 14 and 6 so let's see what that one says laura do you want to read it or do you have your bible with you she might have uh exited the building no, you. i'm here do you have your bible no i'm, I'm in the pantry I'm, I'm not really close to my room actually i'm um, not even right now she's stuck in the pantry I'm like, that's okay um she's making me breakfast thanks laura all right, so <laughs> chapter 14 and 6, John chapter 14 and 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All right, so boom, boom, boom. It was not merely the altar that gave the worshiper access to the holy place by the putting away of his sins, for there had to be a sacrifice upon the altar. The relationship of the brazen altar to every other part of the tabernacle service and its furniture was like that of the root to a tree, the heart to the body, and the foundation to the building. Everything inside and even the brazen labor in the front of the door of the tabernacle depended upon the work done at the altar. Without the brazen altar, all else, no matter how magnificent, was useless. Everyone had to come to God by the way of the altar. All the priests, their garments, the sacred vessels, and everything else were unfit for service until the blood shed at the brazen altar touched and sanctified them. Here is the story of the cross of Christ, Calvary. There is no pardon, no righteousness, no peace no grace, no blessings, and no salvation without the sacrifice of the cross. The altar represents the shedding of blood and the death of Jesus. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Let's go to Hebrews 9 and 27. Hebrews is going to be after John. It's uh, before James and after Timothy. Hebrews 
You said Hebrews what? I don't remember. <laughs> Hebrews 9 and 27. I think I passed it up. Hebrews? I don't see it, actually. Hebrews chapter 9? Oh, you don't see Hebrews or you don't see chapter 9? I don't it's see Hebrews. It's after Colossians, after Ephesians, after Thessalonians. Did you see any of those? It says that they're in here, but I don't see them. Uh, oh, man. Are you missing a chunk of your Bible? That's like the whole New Testament I just listed off. I mean, my dad gave me this Bible when from when he was in prison. This this is a prison Bible. It might be missing pages. pages. I don't know. I don't think he'd rip out the whole Testament, New Testament. Did you see Romans? Yeah, I did. It's after that. Let me see. It's after Philippians. It's after Colossians, it's after First Corinthians and Second Corinthians. I just passed up Chronicles. Chronicles? Why are you in the Old Testament? Oh no! All right, then I guess I got a little past here. <laughs> this thing has both. Cool. <laughs> we like to keep it together because it's really one story. The Old Testament and the New Testament both point to Jesus. Hebrews. All right, now what was it? You found it? Hebrews 9 and 27. 9, 9 and 27. All right. You ready? Mm hmm. And as it is appointed for man to die once, but after this judgment. All right. The fire upon the altar was never to go out. Leviticus 6 and 13. That's one of my favorite songs. Let the fire on my altar never burn out. Let the fire on my altar never burn out. Leviticus 6 and 13. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Um, and unfortunately, they did not obey that and the fire did go out. There is no hour, day or night, that a transgressor cannot find the atonement of, Cal of Calvary. The labor of water. Just before the door of the tabernacle stood the brazen laver, where the priest was required to wash his hands and feet. God told them to wash that they did not die. Exodus 30 and 21. That's right after Genesis. Oh, let me see. Ex Exodus 23 and what? Exodus 30. Oh, 30, 30. I think that's what it said. Exodus 30 and 21. 30 and 21. You want to read it? I'm trying to find 20. Okay, I found it. Yeah. You ready? Mm hmm. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. And it shall be a statue forever for, to them. Uh, to him and his descendants throughout their generations. Mm hmm. At their initial consecration to the priesthood, the priests were washed completely. The labor points to the cleansing from sin we have in Jesus. The initial washing at water baptism, which is for the remission of sins, Acts 2 and 38. Let's go to Acts 2 and 38. What does that say? Mm -hmm.
And that one's after John. I don't know if you're trying to find it. <laughs> Acts 2 and 38. Oh. Where is that at? Hold on. Then Peter. Oh, what? Yeah, it's in the New Testament. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, let's see here, which is for the remission of sins and the continual cleansing we have thereafter. And so first John one and seven talks about the continual cleansing first John one and seven. So that's actually after acts. There's like three or four books of John in here. <laughs> four. All right. First so John 3. Oh, wait, first John 1 and 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. That is, so that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Let's see here. When we are baptized, God washes away our sins. Acts 22 and 16. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16 and 16. Baptism doth also now save us, 1 Peter 3 and 21. But ye are washed but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, 1 Corinthians 6 and 11. And it says, see also Exodus 30 and 18 through, and 18 through 21. Thirty, eighteen 18 through 21. Thou shalt also make a laver of brass and his foot also of brass, to wash withal, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister to burn offering made by fire, unto the Lord. And I was supposed to just do 18 through 20. Oh, through 21. So they shall wash their hands and their feet that they die not, and it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. Thou shalt also make a labor of brass. Oh, it's reading. It's rereading it. Sorry, guys. I didn't realize it was in here. Um, so the laver was placed between the brazen altar where death was required and the tabernacle where the priests officiated and the Lord met them. Exodus 40 and 30. And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar and put water there. To wash with all. And the New Testament experience of salvation, repentance comes first, which is a death with Christ, a death to sin. Then comes water baptism, which is a washing and a burial with Christ. Romans 6 and 3 through 4. 
Let's go to Romans 6 and 3 through 4, and we're going to end with that. Romans 6, you said? Yes, Romans 6. Ooh. Somewhere around here. There we go. Do you want to read it, Tracy? What was it, three through four? Yes. All right, sure, I'll read it. <clears throat> or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized in, into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even though, I mean, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Beautiful. That was beautiful. So what do y'all think about what we talked about so far? We, you know, we talked about the altar. We talked about entering into the gates. Um, and, and we talked about washing and the lava. Did y'all learn anything new? Oh, yes, definitely. I've learned quite a few new things. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember like learning about the tabernacle and how it correlates to our the plan of salvation, you know, um, being baptized and coming to the altar. And what's amazing to me is that we're constantly supposed to be lighting that fire with repentance and everything like that. We're we're not supposed to let that fire die out. So we're supposed to be continually walking in repentance. Um, and, and that's something that definitely stood out to me. We should always have that fire going, a sacrifice on the altar. Um, that definitely stood out to me. I also learned when you walk into the gates. Okay, so this is the plan, the tabernacle plan. When you enter into the gates, when you come into prayer, you come in with thanksgiving and worship. And then you go to the altar and then you go to the lava and ask the Lord to cleanse you because he does. There is a continual cleansing that we got to do, asking him to purify our hearts and everything like that. And that's kind of as far as we got. But um, I actually have the tabernacle plan if um, printed a printout that somebody gave me. So if y'all want something like that, I can send it to you. That was pretty cool. Sure. It's a tabernacle prayer plan, which I've used it, and it's definitely effective. I like it. But um, that's all we're going to do for today. It's been about um, a little bit over an hour, maybe a couple minutes. But um, all right. I love you guys. Is there anything else you want to say before I take us off live? Uh, should we do that prayer now? What's that? Should we do that prayer now? Oh, yeah, we can pray. You can start this one off. I did the last time. Okay. Lord Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to come together and to discuss your word together, Lord God. I pray in Jesus' name that every single thing that we learned or discovered or have heard, Lord God, that was from your word <clears throat> would be impressed in our hearts, Lord God. Help us to apply these things to our life, Lord God. It is so important for us to come to you with praise and thanksgiving, Lord God. It's so important for us to live in continual repentance and continual washing, Lord God, because we are constantly, constantly getting filthy, sinning, doing things, Lord God, that are against your will. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would cleanse us, wash us right now, Lord God, and help us to apply these beautiful things to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bye, Laura. I love you. And peace, y'all, on the stream. Bye, girl. I love you, too. <laughs> Have a good one.